Karis Painter. This is Moves Unfiltered. We explore the dance communities of Philadelphia. We learn how dance is a vehicle of culture, conveying traditions, music, and history. I'm a dancer, an advocate, a storyteller. Come with us as we explore Moves Unfiltered. Karis Painter. This is Moves Unfiltered on Usula Media. Today I'm excited to have on the air Fernando Mendez, who is the host of his own show, The Roundtable. Welcome back, Fernando. Thank you, Karis. Happy to be here. I'm glad to have you here. We have a lot to cover. And the first thing that I wanted to pick your brain about was social events in the time of COVID and moving forward, looking at the arts community and what the arts does and will look like. I know you you have participated, you're a supporter of the arts. I'm curious your thoughts on this. Well, um, I, uh, I anticipate the theater will, will change uh, drastically. Right now, uh, I am familiar with a couple of the troops that operate in town, especially uh, 1812 uh, comedy. Mm. Um, and um, yes, uh, Jane Child uh, runs that operation, and uh, she has been trying to uh, find ways to operate through COVID and as many other uh, entities. You know, you remember the, the uh, there was a... Uh, a concert, I think, on Philadelphia Orchestra was mm. one of the first to to show a concert, and they put all the all the uh, uh, different places in which the musicians were living, and they put it on the screen, and so it looked like an orchestra, but it's all the squares there. Mm. And uh, so it, that was a, a very successful uh, uh, presentation. So theater is doing some of the same. Um, uh, I know Jane Charles and her husband uh, uh, Scott Greer. They they did something like that. They they put on a, a comedy act together, and uh, so you could log on like people do for our shows, and you could find uh, them and and they would, they did a couple of dialogues and and they were very entertaining. They were both very amusing. Mm. Um, so that, that's, those are examples of how people are coping right now with the frustration of not being able to go to the theaters. Mm. Um, that would take a while. I, I think for the most part, uh, I think 1812 has uh, only one thing that they are planning to do maybe towards the end of December. And also probably, uh, again, it will be on the web. It will, it will be... Uh, uh, comedy, they usually do something like this is the week, which is a recap of, of the whole year, and it's it's political satire at the best. So I mm. recommend that if you catch 1812, um, this is the week, uh, mm. towards the end of the year. Um, uh, but there are many other theaters that are just closed. The lights are off. I mean, there are so many theaters that are closed by now, period. And, and they are uh, what, what the actors have done, many many uh, uh, companies, the actors ha have chosen to uh, use more time for uh, rehearsal. Mm. Uh, you see more and more actors engaged in uh, in uh, selling in, mm. in commercial, you know, cars, soap, uh, perfume. More and more actors are looking for other means of, of uh, earning a living. So that's as far as the theater. And, um, and 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 the movies. Uh, it, it's it really is it's tragic the way COVID has disrupted our lives in in such a way. Absolutely, it seems that there's already so many events with work with school happening online. I'm curious what happens in the future with 
the arts as well being online, especially things that used to happen in person that people loved listening to live music, seeing arts, um, experiencing the theater live that hopefully these organizations that are still continuing can stay relevant. Yes, uh, unfortunately, what, what can be safely predicted is that many, many organizations will disappear. They, ju- they cannot mm. stand this period uh, without any production. Without how do they support their actors, their production people? You know, from cameraman, soundman, uh, you name it. When you see the list of credits for uh, a movie or or even for a theater piece, you see the number of people that work on these. Uh, things mm-hmm. and, and oh, uh, if there are no theaters operating, what are these people doing? You know, and uh, so there you go. And so many the, people the, go ahead. <laughs> no, the joke used to be that that waiters and waitresses were on their way to uh, mm-hmm. um, I mean, great actors in the meantime, they were serving tables, and now they're probably back there, many of them, because there's no other other means, except for one thing. The restaurants are also... <laughs> under- it's I mean, true. The- it's not a oh. good place to be in. It's no. Very tough. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're still... Look, um, as far as restaurants, uh, just uh, we know that the uh, major restaurants might survive. They have deep pockets. They can take this for a longer time. And but many of them, many restaurants uh, will um, disappear. We know at least one very uh, famous restaurant here in Center City, Bibu. Mm. They have closed. Uh, Pierre and Charlotte decided they're going to open a gourmet, French gourmet shop. Mm. Uh, that's one. And there's uh, there is a small a, a restaurant on South Street that became very popular during COVID because they found the right way to do it with um, delivering. And it's called Pumpkin. And uh, the owner says there's no way she can function with a 25% or even a 50% uh, uh, audience, you know, uh, clientele. So Absolutely. Especially in places where the rent was so high to begin with and profit margins for restaurants were always very slim. Right, right. And, and it's more, more tragic than that. Imagine, and, and this is the last thing I have to say on this subject, uh, when the, with all the demonstrations in, in, mm. in Center so many businesses were destroyed and they are not mm. coming back. Mm. It's very true. It's very sad and true that, and, and even if yeah. you know they were survived, there's, we ta- I think we talked about this before, there's not so much traffic now that people are working remotely um, right. in Center City or in certain other areas where food, food carts or food trucks, um, even those coffee trucks, their, their bread and butter was the work traffic. Yeah. The traffic. Yeah. There's a company, a medical company that uh, operated, um, they're giving the doctors the licenses. Mm. They give them an exam and the license. Well, they, they fired about uh, 600 people. So mm. that's not going to come back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and there are many buildings in town that are, but the owners of these buildings are concerned because uh, offices will never be as large as they used to be. And they, they may decide that now that they can work from home and, and be just as effective, there's no need to rent these gigantic spaces. So there you are. Yeah, it's it's almost the reverse of the cities were building these buildings and taking away public green space so that more people could come in the city and work. And now people are flooding to green spaces uh, because that's a place that's a refuge from their home and it's safer due to the COVID restrictions. Right. You wonder how these companies that build gigantic campuses, you know, to, mm-hmm. to have workers. All of a sudden they have these uh, a campus that, that is, is a ghost town because nobody, everybody's working from home. Right. Um, that's bad. Mm. So. It's very true. What might have been a slow death, so to speak, in the business world 
as in what we've seen with the retail business, suddenly with the pandemic became corporate real estate became almost obsolete. Yes. Um, um, we have, uh, I mean, look, if, if we want to restart the, the economy properly, uh, as uh, uh, Governor Cuomo put it fr from the beginning, back in, in March, that the only way we can deal with this is if we're able to reopen our schools so the children can go to school mm -hmm. and learn and the parents can go to work. Mm. If we don't have it in that order, we're not going to be able to do it. That's such a great observation. And, and something mm. that we've talked about this before is so salient and important, both of us having worked in education, but we haven't seen that. We haven't seen that on the federal level and without that federal funding, local municipalities, especially, you know, I think of the turnpike and now they've almost replaced most of the toll booths operators, which were pretty decent jobs, especially if you live in a rural county, that was a safe government job, have exactly. been eliminated because there's a lack of traffic and now they can do it electronically. And so states are not getting the funding that they would get otherwise. Um, and so we just yes, haven't seen I, that investment. I had Maria Quinones on my show yesterday and she said that, uh, as long as the principals do not return to the schools, which is not, they are objecting, you know, the principals mm -hmm. have written objecting uh, to the governor. And they, uh, it, she said, if there are no principals, we cannot open the schools. Right. So, hmm. uh, so true. I'm, I'm curious, how did you become, I'm not going to say political, but politically minded or invested in the politics of especially this area yeah. were you always that way interesting yes I, I i think if you ask at least most colombians of my generation and and, and many colombians that uh, i still younger colombians that i have met uh from early on we spent lots of hours uh, at the cafes drinking uh, Tinto and, and, and mm -hmm. discussing politics. And the thing is, uh, uh, conversations, we, we, I don't want to be a, a snob about this, but our conversations were a lot more intellectual than I hear the kids in this country. You know, mm -hmm. we, we will uh, obviously discuss sports many times, mm -hmm. but not exclusively. We were concerned about what was happening in France, what was happening in Spain, what was happening in Chile. You know, Pinochet was a dictator, uh, you know, wh whoever was in the news, we would discuss that and we were fairly well informed. And we enjoyed uh, actually sort of uh, egghead discussions about academics, about you know, the meaning of life sort of discussion without getting that deep into it, you know, just speculating and playing games because we, we were reading all these books that, that explained life and we were saying like, uh, well, a lot of the Chardin says this, and the church opposes that, and, and that kind of discussion. Very casual, but at the same time, very deep for us to learn stuff. We mm -hmm. learn from each other. And what I hear in this country, for the most part, is uh, baseball, and the statistics for football, and who's being traded, and how much money is being, being paid. And, and that is the extent of the discussion among many teenagers. Mm -hmm. In, that's such an interesting observation. It it almost sounds um, the maybe the schooling that the people that you grew up with and had conversations with when you were younger is right. different. Right. Yes. Almost yeah, a, yeah. The, the European model. The European model, and I grew up in an age in where there was a battle for survival between. Uh, the uh, uh, communist idea espoused by the Soviet Union and the American ideal of a free marketplace and with all the countries. And so that was one of the things that dictated in, in, that, in that framework is where we had many discussions and arguments. Because I had friends then that defended the Marxist idea mm. and, and, and they worshiped uh, Fidel Castro and they wanted the revolutions in Latin America to uh, uh, turn the system upside down and all that. 
Mm. Um, so th- those were interesting times. Mm. Uh, now the, the, in, in this age, um, now China has taken the place of the Soviet Union, and we're still engaged in survival. So we'll see if our system does better. Mm. How much do you think of that, as you previously talked about, the kind of conversations that young people have is influenced by social media now? Now, yes, absolutely. Social media. Uh, I, I just give an example that of, of the, the silliness of, of some of the uh, uh, items that appear constantly on uh, Facebook and even on television uh, programs. Is the uh, reality shows, the Kardashians, and, and young girls are worried about uh, their diets and, and the latest fashion and, and all that. So that has uh, influenced uh, our youth tremendously. Mm, absolutely. It's... So, Go ahead. Yeah, in, in my time, it was more possible that we were engaged in discussing the latest book by uh, Jean Paul Sartre or, or, mm. or the latest uh, sculpture by you know, many of the people that were famous at that point. Um, and uh, we, that was not the only thing we did, obviously. I mean, we, we, look, soccer was one of the, the, the topics of conversation, all. <laughs> you know, and, and you pick a team and you have a team. I had Millonarios, my brother had Santa Fe, and it was always like, no, your team is a loser, that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. obviously we did. I mean, we're kids too. But in, in, in uh, the overall effect of, of my education was that they, they brought us to a higher intellectual level. Hmm. Definitely. It's, it's fascinating to hear that um, from somebody who um, didn't necessarily grow up in this area as well. Latin America, people often throw stereotypes at an entire continent. Um, but to hear that right. you you believe that there were just much more richer conversations is is great to hear in many ways. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you another example and a, a, a very quick one, an obvious one, is we, we used to uh, love to read poetry and recite poetry, and people would memorize entire uh, poems, and we, we would choose to uh, read them to each other. And so we, at the time, uh, say Pablo Neruda was one of the famous poets, and we would pick his stuff and, and uh, argue about what the meaning of the poem. Or we would talk about Garcia Marquez, one of the best writers in Latin America. And uh, we would talk about 100 Years of Solitude or any of his books. We'll talk about uh, Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian writer. So those were topics of conversation that, that you nobody's trained uh, to talk about topics, we we were reading the same books and talking about the same thing. Mm. It's it's I I, I want to say refreshing to hear. And speaking of intellectual topics, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm oh curious, yeah. I'm curious of your thoughts on her legacy, but also going forward. Uh yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I really, I, I, I wrote a couple of uh, columns in, in tribute to uh, RBG. Mm. And, um, she was 27 years in, in Supreme Court, and her impact uh, from the beginning and for the future, it, it, it's difficult to understand and to capture how much influence she accepted from the court. As a young lawyer first, arguing before the court, and then as, as a Supreme uh, Justice, their influence was... There is a, a film, you might have seen it, RBG, mm-hmm. that, that uh, helps you to clarify her place in history. Because without her, uh, women would still be underpaid, heavily underpaid, would still be unable to compete in uh, business, Without her, there would not be women in the military. Maybe, maybe somebody else would have done it, but it would have been delayed. Um, she brought equality uh, to women, but the way she argued before the Supreme Court, she was very clever. She argued for a man's right 
to receive Social Security because he became the caregiver for a child whose mother had died. Mm. And so that was a clever thing. She defended men and women. Or she wanted equality. She wanted justice. She, mm. wanted, she wanted a playing field that was even, that was for all, for everybody that was the same. And she dedicated her life to that. And she was very eloquent, uh, small in size, but a giant in terms of the law. Mm. Absolutely. Are you fearful about what might happen in the next month? Uh, yes. I, 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 well, fearful, not so much, but, uh, but fairly certain that, that uh, uh, Trump and uh, McConnell will be able to get what they want to do, which is replace uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg with uh, a, a more conservative judge. They already have a name. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody who is uh, totally pro-life, and, and so that uh, imperils uh, certain laws that have been the law of the land for a long time. Roe versus Wade is one of them. Mm. So, absolutely, and perhaps, a- perhaps people now, especially young people, don't realize the way things were going back thirty years, and also what she affected that that they might take for granted oh yes yeah as, as i said she she, she argued for women to vote mm. uh to control their bodies with uh, you know abortion is necessary to have equal rights in uh, uh the workplace mm. and as i said before to compete uh, to to be able to join the military she won that famous case for the virginia military institute that they would not accept uh, Karet uh, as woman, and and that she opened the door for that, and then there were, you know, more and more women joining the uh, the military in this country. So, absolutely, we are going to move to a break, Fernando. It's always great hearing your insights and your opinions. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about a subject you care a lot about politics and the upcoming debates and anything else you would like to share. So okay. with that, <laughs> thank you, Fernando, Fernando Mendez for being a guest this morning. When we come back, we'll dive a little deeper. I'm Karis Painter. This is Moves Unfiltered on Usla Media. Olivia is our producer. We'll be right back. If you love them enough to suck the snot out of their nose at 4 a.m., then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're in the right car seat. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. I have a mentor, and she convinced me to continue my education. No one receives a diploma alone. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. I'm Karis Painter. This is Moves Unfiltered on Usula Media. I'm happy to have back Fernando Mendez, who is the host of the round table. Olivia is our producer. Welcome back, Fernando. I'm glad to be back. (laughs) Um, Let's continue talking about your journey into your interest in politics and the upcoming debates. Have, did you ever participate in debates as a, a participant? I'm curious when you were younger. Debate, yeah, it's cool debates. Uh, yeah, but not they were not <laughs> formal in a way, but it was, uh, Did- yeah, you, you would state something that I, uh, I like uh, Mr. So and so as president because he's promising to uh, do this for education and the economy, blah blah blah. And somebody else would say, Well, not like this other guy because he's better. Oh, that, interesting, that kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I bet you were very good at it. 
Um, I, I was uh, I was decent. Uh, you know, there, I grew up with a lot of people who were who were very well educated and, and able debaters. And uh, I had a friend of mine we graduated at the same time. He went to Germany, and I came to the United States. Uh, but we, we used to engage in those uh, skirmishes. Uh, yeah, he didn't like Germany. He, he found that they were still prejudiced. <laughs> really? He, he, left. he returned to Colombia. Yes. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, he was not happy in Germany. Uh, I didn't encounter, you know, uh, I did not encounter in my person any, any prejudice. I was lucky that way. But um, if there was any prejudice, it was probably too subtle for me to notice. So. Uh, mm. That was it. Absolutely. Do you, do you think debates influence voters' decisions? Do you think they will coming up? Well, it, and that is the hope always of debaters and the people who organize them and uh, the media people who, who like to run them. Um, the, the hope is that uh, somehow the debate will clarify issues and will make us more clearly which one in this case, you know, which one of these candidates will make a better precedent. And, but the thing is, with, with one, two or three debates, um, it, could, it could happen that there is like one instance that leaves the other candidate knocked down on the floor. And, and it, so it's an instant judgment on on, on the ability of that candidate. So mm. uh, it would be like uh, Lloyd Benson when he compared, uh, when, when um, the, the presidential, uh, vice presidential candidate said something that, about being like John Kennedy. And Lloyd Benson immediately says, sir, you are, you, you are not JFK. JFK was my friend. I knew JFK very well, and you are no JFK. So that was like very destructive for. Uh, um, he was he was the vice president for uh, George H. W. Bush. Mm. Was, hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, famous famous case. I'll I'll give you the name in a, in a little bit. Um, but uh, that's one case, and so the. They're hoping that at some point there will be one of those questions that a debater is unable to answer, or he goes too long, or he gives the wrong answer, period. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that will destroy the candidacy right away. Um, there were other periods, like uh, simple, simple things that would destroy a, a candidate. Um, Edmund Muskie uh, crying. Uh, that, so that didn't help him. Um, Michael Dukakis uh, getting into a tank and driving a tank around. He looked he looked like a little mouse um, handling a, a tank. That, that that didn't help him. I don't know what he intended to do with that, hmm. but that didn't help him. Um, Reagan became the nominee of the Republican Party at some point, and the debate says, "I am paying for these microphones," and that was like. Uh, asserting his command of the situation. So that helped him. Hmm. Um, the, so you know, there might be a surprise like that. And uh, in the debate between uh, Trump and, and uh, Hillary, I don't know if you recall that, that all of a sudden Mr. Trump stood around Hillary like uh, over her shoulder. She didn't know what, what I, was I, happening. I, I do remember that. And that was very disconcerting for her. And, you know, one thing, the, the the fact that television plays such a big role now because now we can see them you know physically we can see them sweat we can see them expressing concern with with their face mm. um, that makes a difference the debate between Nixon and JFK is famous for one thing people who heard the debate on the radio were convinced that Nixon won people who saw it on television were convinced that JFK won. Mm. And guess why? Why why would you think that JFK Be won? Because they could see something very different on TV. Because he was more youthful, he was better looking, he looked yes. relaxed. 
all his friends from Hollywood had prepared him for the camera. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was in good shape. Nixon was sweating, and he had the five o'clock beard already. It was like, oh, my God, what a disaster. And yet, he had the best answers. <laughs> so mm -hmm. never know. Absolutely. Do you have a preference on one that you'd like to watch more, either the presidential or the vice presidential debates? No, I, I, I watch uh, both. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I like, I, even when people say, oh, they were so boring because they all, you know, they are canned answers and they, they don't do anything special. So, okay, so that may happen during, uh, let's say, the first debate, let's say, hmm. because they are both sort of tentative and, and mm, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say anything controversial here. I'm just going to promise to be good for the economy. And I'm going to uh, show people that they're going to have their health care. Never get out of that uh, line of thinking. But you never know what, what throws them off with, with a question. You know, like the famous question uh, Roger Mudd posed to Ted Kennedy, who was on his way to becoming the candidate for the Democratic Party. And mm -hmm. Roger Mudd's uh, question derailed Kennedy forever because he said, oh, Mr. Kennedy, why do you want to be president? And, hmm. uh, and Teddy Kennedy did not expect that. He stumbled. Hmm. And, oh, you never know what question, what instance in the debate uh, will be memorable, memorable and, and change the whole situation. Absolutely. There was a New York Times article, I want to say that either came out today or yesterday, on how to debate someone who lies. And it's very interesting, not only for a political debate, but I, I would assume also for communication between two people where someone else lies and or has um, misinformation and one of the, and is unwilling to listen, one of the suggestions was to throw in humor and to make it uh, almost a, a laughable answer to laugh at their answer um, especially That's somebody right. who is who is narcissistic and or just doesn't doesn't believe in in facts mm -hmm. uh, super uh, interesting yeah <laughs> reagan was famous for a couple of those quips that would make people laugh and, and uh, one of them was that uh, he told his opponent uh, uh, at the time, I, 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 I can see his face, but I cannot remember his name right now. I, um, he said, I would not, Reagan was at that point uh, already 70 years old. And he mm -hmm. said that he would not question the age of his opponent for the purposes of exploiting it in the debate. So, <laughs> so his, his opponent was much younger, was a senator. Uh, I cannot remember his name, unfortunately, because at my advanced age, I have forgotten things. But uh, here we go. Absolutely. It, sh it should be very interesting, especially um, given what has transpired in the, the last four years. When the debates happened in 2016, there wasn't much of a political record um, for, for our president to go on or to use. So it'll be interesting now to see what evidence is, is used for his statements. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, it, it was Walter Mondale, it's, uh, the one that Reagan uh, said uh, that I will not um, uh, debate your uh, inexperience, your youth and inexperience for the purposes of this debate. Anyway, so it was uh, very good. I have a question for you. Um, one of the topics that you were interested in, in chatting about was evangelicals for Trump. And I'm curious, just overall, how much do you think religion should play in choosing a leader? Should that even be a consideration? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, it, it has been in this country since the time of JFK. Mm. Remember, he, many questioned his arrival because they thought the Pope would have undue influence because mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So people just like that idea. But then we have uh, other presidents that were 
Uh, I think uh, the next one was a Quaker. Um, well, a Quaker in maybe in on writing in writing is somebody who. Uh, you mean in, in name only? <laughs> uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, it it could be. Um, it, it could be that he was uh, honest. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's uh, well, he lied through his teeth, but, <laughs> but it was mostly about politics. We don't know about his private life. He seems mm -hmm. to be a good guy. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead. <laughs> there's some the religion, like uh, with, with, with uh, Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a tremendous obstacle in his case, because it's a uh, uh, Mormonism, sort of an odd religion, I'm sorry to say. I, you know, I don't want to question anybody's faith. Mm. But this whole thing, uh, you know, uh, if, if you study what it is, there are some aspects of it that you say, like, no, I don't think so. Right. But, uh, there's one thing about the Mormons, though. Uh, there's a famous rich man, uh, uh, Mr. Hughes, who was a, uh, he was a pilot, and then he was became a multi-millionaire, one of the richest men, uh, uh, Howard Hughes. And he preferred to hire Mormons. He said they're the most honest people. He, he would trust them with his life. He, that's, so all his aides were Mormons. Hmm. So, Interesting. Well, didn't he used to live in Massachusetts? Uh, uh, Mitt, Romney. Mitt Romney? Yes. Yeah, he became governor. Um. It's very, it's very interesting because they're two very different states. Um, he became governor of Massachusetts. That's the, you know. So the man has ability, political ability. Uh, I, I don't think his Mormonism came into question at any point of, when he became a candidate. But uh, he just at this point, I'm I'm sort of disappointed. Uh, with Republicans in general, because they have allowed Mr. Trump to uh, roughshod, <clears throat> run a mark with the debates and in, in regarding uh, the replacing of Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg, and I don't know if if he's going to get away with it. I suppose he is. He and Mitch McConnell to run it. Uh, Mitt Romney is one of the uh, Republicans who who I saw was an object, but he didn't. He said that, that he would vote uh, to have another conservative judge. Mm. So I guess that's first in his mind, as opposed to justice and fairness and ethics and all the rest, because he knows what this president is. Then he, but here's one thing, the caveat for anybody who thinks that the judge is automatically going to follow Trump's line. When they take on that mantle, I think there's something that the, the gravitas of the moment must finally overtake them and say, okay, I have to think fairly and clearly, and that could happen. So. Exactly, and I, I, I think that's true of many people who work in public office, and part of their onboarding is saying you won't engage in political activities as long as you're serving, you are serving the people of the United States. And I would assume, especially if you are a judge and your whole life has been in the legal profession, that you are very well aware of not only the impact of your decisions, but what you are expected to do and follow. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I think as much as... Um, there is that worry um, because they do decide very big cases. There are oaths of office that they take. It's interesting to see the, I don't know if you've read much about the person who was working for the COVID task force under Pence, a woman who recently quit, I believe she quit, and now she's coming out to say that there were things that were happening from the very start of this COVID task force that just didn't match up with the science that was also coming out. Right, I saw that. I saw that. That, uh, um, and and, but he, that's one of the problems that many of the uh, uh, documents issued by the 
the COVID task force, were doctored by the White House, were controlled by the, the content was controlled, dictated, edited by the White House. And mm. so that's, you know, it's worrisome because then there, there's no way you can rely on those. So uh, the only way uh, I found that I could rely on on, on the people who who knew about it and who were running the the programs was uh, Dr. Fauci and and Burks. You could hear them in person, you know, mm-hmm. when they were interviewed on television, and they w- they would speak the truth. Um, Trump even contradi- contradicted the head of the CDC, and then uh, the guy uh, wrote uh, said, "No, I still believe that masks are necessary." And so Trump was trying to uh, uh, make him keep quiet or change his mind. Trump said he misunderstood the question. He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, that's mm. not true. Mm. So this Judge Amy Coney Barrett is the expected pick for Trump to replace uh, Judge uh, RBG. Do you think she uh, will get confirmed before the election? Ah, uh, that's a question. <laughs> the Democrats are going to try to stop it, to prolong this, so that she cannot be uh, elected or appointed before the uh, November 3rd. Um, but from what I understand, uh, Mitch McConnell has the numbers. So hmm. Interesting. So we have about three minutes left before we need to wrap up. Final oh, thoughts. What? I know. We, <laughs> I don't know, unless my clock is going super slow. Um, final thoughts, thoughts on work. I know you are very active in several communities on getting people out to vote, uh, making sure that people have the right information. Anything else to share going forward? Well, for immediately for anybody who's listening and who's concerned about uh, those ballots and uh, understanding the whole process uh, and worried about what you're going to vote, uh, the city is opening beginning today. Several places where you can get all the information, get the paperwork if you want to vote, uh, even deposit your vote. Uh, so there are... Uh, I believe there were 17 uh, places, uh, schools, public schools, and all that. Uh, there will be names uh, uh, coming out. Uh, they will be published of where this, the, the schools are. And also, in addition to that, one big center, the Leacore Center at Temple University, is, mm-hmm. is one place that will be open to the public to to do all that. The process of of voting, getting getting your uh, forms and filling them out and all that. So absolutely that's very important information. Votespa.com has information as well. Um, count, contact your county office, which will have information on ballots when they might be mailed out. Uh, according to my sources, they were waiting to actually produce the ballots because they needed to decide if there was going to be a Green Party candidate on the forms as well. And there is not going to be a Green Party candidate or Green Party checkbox. So the ballots um, can be now produced. Thank God, because look, um, any any young people who want to make a statement by writing in, uh, you know, Sanders name or uh, another name that... uh, that you prefer, you would that vote is a, a vote um, that Mr. Biden doesn't get, and a vote mm. that Mr. Trump gets the advantage. So if, unless you're unless you're for Trump, then you want to do that. But don't waste your vote. This is not a time to make uh, statements about uh, the, the uh, philosophy that you espouse the most. This we have to be practical. This is the election, the most important election of my lifetime, for, for sure. And we can waste to vote. Absolutely. Um, having the ability to vote is something that we are very lucky to have in this country and in many other countries that do have the right to vote. It is required 
And that is something that those citizens take very seriously, and we all should as well. Whether we are in love with a candidate or not, it is our right to have a say in who gets elected to the highest office in this country. Fernando Mendez, thank you very much for your time and your insights. It's always a pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Olivia is our producer. I'm Karis Painter. This is Moves Unfiltered on Usula Media. Until next time.